No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man, Heraclitus. A sudden, profit-driven decision to close an emergency facility can have a destabilizing effect on an entire region, and people deserve a complete picture on the ramifications of a potential closure. Pennsylvania State Senator Carolyn Kamina. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. W.B. Yates. Hi, I'm Frank Spidell, a retired emergency physician and recovering hospital administrator, and welcome to The Doctor Is In. In this show, with the help of guests, we explore health care in the U.S. and its interface with society. Now, I am neither an infectious disease specialist, nor epidemiologist, nor public health official. For guidance and health care decisions, I recommend you consult your primary physician. On April 5th, the Philadelphia Inquirer published an article detailing yet again the closure of another hospital in Pennsylvania, this one in Borough, oh, Pennsylvania. The closure of two of the five acute care hospitals in Chester County prompted an earlier program with Professor Harry Holt of Westchester University. In this program, we discuss the drivers of health care contraction. I think the drivers of the contraction are multifactorial. Some are interrelated, some are independent, some obvious, and some subtle, all adding to what Shakespeare would call a witch's brew. Or as W.B. Yeats phrased, things fall apart. Oops, the center cut hold. Professor Holt highlighted what I think of as the commoditization of healthcare. What do I mean by commoditization of healthcare? If I have capital, I can buy commodities, bundle them together so as to add value, that is create wealth, and then flip them, sell them for a profit. That the price being more than the sum of the component parts, I buy falling hospitals and at discount, bundle them together and impute their market presence has added to their value. Flip them. Two hospitals closed in Chester County, Brandywine and Southern Chester County Medical Center, had once been independent. They were bought by CHS, Community <laughs> Health Services, along with three other regional hospitals. Now, CHS is a publicly traded for-profit company. Since June of 2020, it has been listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Subsequently, CHS sold five Pennsylvania hospitals to Tower Health, including Jennersville, Southern Chester County Medical Center, and Brandywine, for $418 million. But beyond turning the provision of health care into a commodity to be bundled, brokered, and speculated, there are other drivers of contraction of health care in the U.S. The compensation for providing care has not kept pace with the cost of the care. Again, we are in debt to the fine reporting by Harold Brubaker of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mr. Brubaker reported almost all Philadelphia air, area health systems are losing money. Why? The cost of providing care, the inputs needed, drugs, labor, the people at the bedside, doing the labs, cleaning the halls, and other resources has gone up by about 25%. While what is paid for the care is a single digit increase. Mr. Brubaker reports the regional wide negative margins for all institutions except for Penn Medicine and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Negative operating margins are not sustainable. Yet most of us see ourselves spending more for health care. Those with good insurance are used to writing checks in addition to our insurance premiums. We are spending more than we used to, and it's not just us as individuals. It's a national trend. So health care expenditures are going up. But why does the increase in the expenditures not cover the cost of care provided? Well, yet there's an, another reason. The market basket of goods we purchase has changed. We aren't buying the same care before. When I was an intern in the 70s, we managed, we imaged the brain by doing carotid arteriograms. Not much information, but a lot of complications and noise. Think of the scene from The Exorcist where Megan receives an arteriogram. But in the 70s, CT scans were introduced and then MRIs. 
vastly safer and flooding with high resolution information. We have gone from driving a third hand Volkswagen bug to cruising in a Lamborghini. We have con collectively convinced ourselves we can have a Lamborghini <coughs> at VW <coughs> prices. To help us understand our challenges of increasing spending while we see services constricting, I am honored to have as our guest, Dr. Sean Ryan. Dr. Ryan is an actively practicing board certified vascular and general surgeon. In addition, Dr. Ryan has an MBA and has been a careful observer and documenter of the swirling economic chaos that is healthcare in the U.S. Welcome to the Doctor is in, Dr. Ryan. And what did I get wrong? <laughs> Not much. <clears throat> There's a lot there. There's a lot there to unpack. So, uh, Did you always want to be a physician? Uh, yeah, since high school, I always wanted to be a physician. I was, I was sort of interested in biology. Uh, but, um, you know, mom wanted me to be the doctor and dad wanted me to be a businessman. So um, I was an econ undergrad at Penn. Um, and then, but I, I still took my science courses and then found my way into medical school. Um, yeah. I, then, I was going to ask you why the MBA, but that's a natural outgrowth of trying to balance your mom and dad. <laughs> when did you get your MBA? So when I first applied for fellowship for vascular, I was thinking that I wanted to get an MBA. And my program director, um, Bruce Perler down at Johns Hopkins, he had his MBA. And he said, hey, if you come here, I can get you the first year of your MBA. I said, great, I'll do that. So I did that. It was a sort of a business of certificate in medicine. And then once I got out into practice, you know, I was really focused on my practice. But I had it in my back of my mind to get this thing finished up. And I just finished it at, at Villanova 2021. That's an unusual perspective. And that's one of the reasons I'm glad you're here to talk. You're here today to talk and share with us. Uh, you certainly have a different view of healthcare delivery, knowing the dollars and cents, nuts and bolts of it. Uh, what changes have you seen in interventional vascular surgery since you uh, started? <clears throat> so the changes in vascular surgery have been profound and vast. Um, I can remember early in my career, we would have anywhere from five to seven patients in the ICU having undergone major aortic aneurysm surgery, um, big surgery, big complications, seven to 10 days in the hospital and a few months of recovery. The endovascular revolution sort of came through vascular surgery and I, I do more wire pushing in endovascular now than I do open surgery. Um, sometimes our aortic, pa aortic aneurysm patients go home the same day. Oh my Lord. <clears throat> yeah, Most, almost all the next morning, but some even the same day. I, yeah. I did not know that. that yeah. is, that's incredible. Yeah, so the whole paradigm of vascular surgery has changed completely from the 90s to, to today, and it's continuing to change. You know, it's, been, it's been a neat time to be a vascular surgeon. I suspect the success rates for doing an endovascular elective repair is profoundly different. For aortic aneurysms, you're, you're definitely treating patients that you couldn't treat before, and the mortality and morbidity is a lot less than open surgery, for sure. In some of the other cases where we're doing endovascular procedures, certainly much easier on the patient short term, but some questions about long-term dur durability. I would think in, in your career, you have seen the market basket of goods and the benefits to the patient has changed dramatically. Dramatically, yes. I mean, listen, I think we're gonna talk a lot about um, the difficulties with our healthcare system, but it is still an amazing healthcare system where, yes. where you know, um, you could, you know, if you're having chest pain now, within an hour, you can be in a in, in a very advanced cardiac cath lab, and 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 have your life saved, uh, which is <clears throat> which is incredible. Which I, is incredible. Yeah, I've shared the story on this program recurrently over the last four years of my experience of having a young person in his forties die before us in the emergency department at a local hospital, and then in my last days walking the halls of a hospital as a CEO with the cath labs turning 
seeing the same four, a 40 year old similar anoreceptal infarct come in and the next day after breakfast is going home. Yep. It is a vastly different market basket of goods. Uh, how do you feel about the reporting and discussions that we have about healthcare and healthcare financing? I, I love it. Politics, religion, and healthcare financing. Let's do it. <laughs> do you ever find yourself when you're with friends watching what you say because you don't want to throw gasoline on the briquettes? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think my partners who, you know, um, when I start talking about the business of medicine, sometimes, you know, they're like, hey, listen, I got to take another call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's not for everybody, but that, that's, you know, that's a good thing that doctors aren't always that concerned about it. Uh, <clears throat> you sort of alluded to something. Uh, politicians in politics uh, have left their fingerprints on the financing of health care. Pick your brain. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Ryan? Well, you know, if I could, if I could be a benevolent dictator, um, I'd get government out of healthcare, um, and not because I don't think they've not done good. I think there's been a lot of good there. It's just that we find ourselves in a situation today where every four years or every eight years, we have completely opposing ideologies coming in. And that's not going to be good for our healthcare system. I uh, I keep coming back to the fact of Medicare. I think is with us for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. There's a challenge, though, in the sense that Medicare, how much money is given to Medicare, is decided by a political process, right? And we have to balance the budget. No, we don't balance the budget, but we have to constrain how much we spend, or we try to constrain how much we spend. So the, um, I don't know who said it, but the, the first law of economics is a study in, in um, limited resources, right? Mm -hmm. The first law of politics is to ignore the first law of economics. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, sat, we, we have limited resources. And when you put together the cost access and the quality, you know, that triangle, it's hard to achieve all three um, in our system, or at least the way the system is set up now. As I said earlier, I think the expectation is that we will have ever increasing quality, ever increasing availability, and ever diminishing cost. And in, in a lot of industries, like if you're making a widget, yes, um, that's, that's kind of what we see. Um, but in, in healthcare, we see the opposite. Um, we see, we, we're, we're definitely getting better quality. I, you know, I, I don't think anybody would argue that our quality is better, uh, but the costs are not going down. I could not agree with you more. Yeah. Access is becoming more of an issue for people. Um, just getting in to see their primary care doctor, just getting in to see a specialist. It can be months. So access and cost are not getting better. <clears throat> and we tend to, I'm not, I'm not attributing this to politicians or, or the governing folks or the bureaucracy that's taking care of it. I think in general, we like to find villains. We like to identify villains. And depending on the group that you're talking to, there will be a different villain identified. Uh, I think one of the things I've come to appreciate with birthdays is that many people have genuinely good motivation and want to do the right thing. I guess it depends on your point of view what the right thing to do is. I, I, so I take a little bit of a different perspective. I think if you, you know, the system that you set up is going to produce results. Um, and there's going to be first order results, second order results, third order results. And um, if you set up a system in such a way that um, that incentivizes more, uh, more medicine, more charges, more tests, more this, that's what you're going to get. And so, I, you know, I that's that's just a simple setting up a system of incentives, which is a lot about economics too, um, 
that's that's the outcome that you're going to get. And I think that the real, in my mind, the 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 CPT DRG HICPIS system that we have in place today. You know, it was it was really thought of at the time as a real revolutionary a, a revolutionary change in the way we financed healthcare. But when you fast forward, you know, forty years, it's on steroids. And, you know, and it's 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 not working. There's a I call it Spidel's <clears throat> theorem. <clears throat> the more vital a system, the more vital a process is to society. When it starts to fail, the response of those people, of those governing, will be more regulation. Is that just an, an immature view that I have, or have you seen that too? Sure. I mean, you, I, the phrase that I hate um, is, you know, the, 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 you know, never, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? But I, I hate that phrase. But it's been a, a reason for government to get more and more and more involved in healthcare, and in pretty much almost every other industry or aspect of human mm -hmm. uh, our lives in America. I, I think banking might be worse. I think energy might be worse, but. But healthcare is right up there, and it's continuing to get worse. People with the best intentions, having no experience, feel they can walk in and start telling you how to do your job. It has been, <clears> through <throat> my career, I've seen this has been a recurring complaint. I remember way back when uh, there was a movement, pain is the fifth vital sign. And uh, that sounded like a good idea because maybe some of us weren't treating pain adequately. That unleashed devils, and uh, it was a long time to get that put away and move to a better spot. Yeah, we're still in a bad spot with regard to that. But, And I can remember being a resident being directly marketed to and saying, we're not giving enough pain medications to people and, you know, we need to give more. I think we could have a whole talk on the ills of the pharmaceutical industry. On the one hand, they've done great things for mm -hmm. America. On the yes. other hand, yeah, you know, there's practices going on there that maybe aren't always in the best interest of the patient. I doff my cap to the research development <clears throat> and creativity. I shrivel when I think about the marketing functions, uh, the, the abuses, the uh, direct marketing to patients nowadays, I'm not sure is in the patient's best interest. No, I have that as a topic of, we need to get rid of that. Look, any other topics, <laughs> any things that you think we should get rid of? We'll get to it, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> In what direction should we move to help reverse this shrinking contraction of health resources available to the patient? Well, I mean, I think that if you if you're going to re rethink the system, um, from my standpoint, I I think about certain principles, which are, um, and it start with some broad principles first. First is, is I would I was as, as much as possible try to get government out of the picture. Um, they're, they're they're the biggest player in healthcare and they're they're not readily going to get out. And the, I think a lot of politicians want to control healthcare, and I think a lot of other politicians are like why why do we want to be involved in healthcare? Uh, as much as possible, I would try to get them out. I think that um, I think we have to recognize that whatever we try to change something, there are going to be downsides. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be problems with that as well. Uh, but we'll address them as we go along. Um, free market in healthcare. I think a lot of people will say, well, we've tried the free market. We know the free market. And it didn't work. And I, I think, well, we tried the free market prior to the 1960s when medicine was a completely different game. Nowadays, you know, we walk around with a supercomputer in our pocket. And if we can have price transparency and outcome transparency, and we have the opportunity and the time to actually go find the best outcome at the best price, which there's a lot of opportunities for that in healthcare, then we can apply free market principles and get the bureaucrats out of the way. Now, if I'm underneath a bus because I just got hit, 
Well, then I want insurance to kick in because I'm going to spend, you know, some time in the ICU, which is expensive care. But when I'm underneath the bus and there's 100 people gathered around me to see me get hit by that bus, those 100 people are not getting hit by the bus and they're paying into an insurance premium so that I can go to the ICU. And that's insurance. I'm going to ask you to put your MBA cap back on for a second. So what you're telling me is that what we call health insurance right now isn't really insurance. We're not pooling risks. We're actually creating a cartel that goes into the marketplace and gets providers to bid. Yeah, and I think it's we I think that this is where the political landscape gets a little wonky because we've mandated benefits to these plans. Um, Independent of risks. Independent of risks. Yeah, that's a good point. And Um, so the insurance companies, of course, they're, they're going to try to put the best product out there at the, at the best price for their consumers, but they have to make money too, you know? So, but if they're mandated as well, you have to put X, Y, and Z in this plan, it's going to be more expensive, you know? One plan does not fit all. And, and that's what we're buying today in, in healthcare insurance is we're, we're really buying a plan where there's an ideology that um, if you just pay this premium, then you can get all your health care for free. And we haven't seen that. You know, that doesn't happen. Instead, what's happening is premiums are going up, deductibles are going up, co-pays are going up, um, and we're getting pushed into narrower networks and less physicians are taking Medicaid. Some say, but parts of the country, they don't take Medicare. Yes, that that was, you know, I see that <clears throat> where Medicare, you, know. you have to fight with people um, to get them to take it. Yeah, so. Yeah. Let me make, a, let me stretch something a bit. Um, education in the United States, uh, you were talking about getting the free market more involved. Uh, some very bright people have said, okay, we're going to fund public education. There is, uh, we, we tax so that we have money that every, Every young person growing up can be educated. We can sign the money as a voucher to parents, and parents then get to look, as you say, transparency of results and transparency of pricing, and let parents choose where to send their school because they're going to they're in the, they have their child's best interest. Suppose we did that for health care. Suppose I got a voucher and I got to choose my provision. Yeah. I mean, one of the principles I think we also have to do in America is this principle of subsidiarity, which is to try as much as possible to bring things down to the local level. And as you know, uh, you know, I've I've been involved in a lot of the hospitals in this area, in this, in this region. And there's a very wide socioeconomic scale. Yes. And not all communities are the same. So to your point, if we created a voucher system uh, or, you know, a health savings account type of system, um, that allows the parent to, you know, to shop out the best care uh, when they have the time uh, and, and, and the, and the information to, to make those decisions. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence that people can, will make those decisions. Will some people make bad decisions? Yes. Will some people choose not to do it? Yes. Well, no program is going to fix that. I think this is a great start, though. Uh, what you're suggesting argues that we need to talk about this more in an environment like this without the usual cliche and, and lumping together. Any other things you want to share with the audience right now? You know, I, I would say that, um, you know, when Medicare first came out, it was means tested. You know, mm-hmm. it, really, yes. it really wasn't for everybody. Yes. Um, and I get that, the, you know, it was maybe out of fairness that, you know, we, we shouldn't have that. But I think we, we're probably going to have to get back to some type of means testing. Um, in order to provide for the people who are at the lowest rung of the of the ladder. Exactly. You know, exactly. and, and um, you know, I'm okay with that. Uh, we have we we have to consciously address 
those vulnerable and those most at risk by their situation. Uh, it's been a great, I, Dr. Ryan, uh, I wanna thank you for bringing uh, insights to the cost of healthcare in the United States, but more importantly, uh, Sean, uh, I wanna thank you and you and your partners for what you have given to the community recurringly, nights and weekends, holidays. Uh, for Thanksgivings, I know there have been times when you weren't sitting down to Turkey, but you were in the OR. Uh, the uh, commitment that you and your colleagues at the bedside, the nurses and the therapists and everything. Sometimes being in the OR is better than being with my family. Uh, we won't, we, we're going to delete that last comment by Dr. Ryan. <laughs> but I, and I mean this <clears throat> sincerely. But thank you. Uh, what you, what you, you are a difference maker, and that's a great comment about any of us. Uh, for our victor, for <laughs> our viewers, uh, thank you for watching. Sometimes real progress comes not from broadcasting answers, but from asking questions. Be safe.